Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lords of Limited. My name is Ben Warney, and joining me on the line, as always, Mr. Ethan, fear of missing out, Sax. Ethan, <laughs> there has been so much <laughs> happening this weekend in Magic the Gathering Las Vegas, and I have been stuck at marching band just staring at my phone during the downtime, <laughs> <laughs> wishing I were in Vegas. Yeah, uh, a lot. Like, we have, like, three lines at the top of our show notes of, like, big news drops that happened this weekend. And I feel like that's going to take a bulk of the discussions <laughs> for this episode. Just so much happening. Does it make you, like, are you really like, oh, I'm definitely locked for Vegas next year. Don't want to miss a thing. I'm I'm 100% locked. I was 100% locked when they announced the date. But the way I felt this weekend was, like, I don't want to miss this ever again is how I was feeling. <laughs> This weekend, like I don't, I don't like this feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, very, very exciting. We're recording on uh, Sunday morning here before Worlds Top Eight. There was a, a two day sealed hundred k that happened. Pretty crazy to see so many people do back to back. You see Mengu top aided back to back the hundred k's in Vegas. Yeah, Matt Nass also back on the PT. Oh, right. Alex was crushing and almost top eighted again. He finished X and three. Which I think was the same that happened to him last year, too. He, like, just missed out on top eight last year. So, I mean, yeah, just people who crush limited, crushing limited, more at 11, I guess. But, like, yeah, a lot of awesome stuff happening. Plus Worlds, um, Kai Buddha, top eighting Worlds, maybe another World Championship. Back like, to, could you imagine repeating as World Champion two cards <laughs> with your name and image and likeness on them? <laughs> well, three of the top eight are, I mean, everyone will know what happened by the time this listens, so our excitement is probably silly, but... um three of the top eight competitors have the chance to be repeat. Plus, who's it? Marcio Carvalho uh, has been a runner up twice before. Like, so crazy. Um, so many people um, just consistently putting up results at the highest stage. It's hard to not get excited. How, what's the line in Moneyball? How can you not be romantic about baseball? How can you not be romantic about magic, you know? I mean, you'll love to see it. Here's how you can not be romantic about Magic the Gathering. When it turns uh -oh. into Magic the Gathering Spider-Man and Magic the Gathering <laughs> SpongeBob. Right. So, I guess, so I guess we're going to get into this. They announced the universe is beyond becoming standard legal, and it'll be half of the sets moving forward, or at least in 2025, until people revolt. Ben, tell me why you're mad, and then I'll tell you why you're wrong. It's not that I'm mad. It's like... I'm bummed. And I, I know that feels gatekeepery or whatever, but I, I love this game. And I've loved this game since I was a little kid. And like the Lord of the Rings things made sense. Like those are both high fantasy whatevers. And I initially thought, mm, I'm not going to like this. And it was it was fine. And I probably will experience the same thing with Magic the Gathering SpongeBob because magic is magic and magic is great. But my initial gut reaction to seeing the game that I love, that I love talking to you about every week, it feels like it's cheapening itself in some ways or I mean, it literally it literally is selling out, right? Like selling out, but also, also making it more expensive to play because they're paying money for these IPs and the prices mm -hmm. of the booster packs are going up, whatever. I, I just don't love it. It feels like Magic's got enough worlds of its own to to go to. And I, I guess this is going to bring new people into the game. New people coming into the game is great. But I just I just worry about Magic losing its identity. I want like I'm curious about they, they would never share metrics much like Netflix will never like it'll be like it's the number one show in the country and you're like who's actually watching this um Wizards will never release you know the actual data but I'd be curious to know like how many people who are fans of Spongebob are going to start playing magic in any serious sense because of magic the gathering of magic SpongeBob. spongebob like i'm not that doesn't that that doesn't make any sense to me personally but i'm kind of an enigma yeah i mean like i, I don't quite i'm just sort of waiting for some ip that i actually like, give me like Matt, universes beyond super mario brothers or mega man like give me something that i actually teenage mutant ninja turtles give me something i care about because like so far i'm like this, none of this is really singing for me but um when they do finally do that i feel like i'll i'll be excited and as long as it like the 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 fact that they're just sort of actually owning up to hey it's six releases like there were six releases this year for folks who are going to feeling like oh my god that's overwhelming there were four standard sets modern horizons 3 plus foundations coming up plus there's going to be actual it has been announced pioneer masters is coming in a month so that's seven sets that we'll be having to review on the show 
And I say, bring it on. That that makes my life easier. I feel like, like, because when, the, <laughs> when the, if the set's a dud, then we're moving on quickly. And if the set's awesome, great, we're going to run out of or have no shortage of things to discuss. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's I, I get all the hubbub, but it feels a little bit like what you said, like not gatekeepy, but like I, I don't quite like. I don't quite know why it changes things other than you just feeling like, well, now, instead of casting Soren, I'm casting SpongeBob and that's dumb. It's like casting Soren is dumb. Sorry. No, casting Soren was cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. Like that, that IP fit into, it was a more natural fit. It didn't feel quite so shoehorned in. I, I don't know. I'm sure it will be fine when we get to it. I just, it was. To be clear, def- I was saying Soren, like S-O-R-I-N, not Sauron. Oh, yeah, okay. This is the, like the I, the IP was magic IP that I was referring to. I heard Sauron. <laughs> Got Lord of the Rings I think, on the I brain. Think I conflated the two names. Yeah, those are my thoughts on universes beyond. It's just it was. It's not. I'm not angry about it. It was just like uh, difference, change. You know, I hate change. I know you hate change, but it's coming. <laughs> Much like the blocking rules change that was announced this week as well. Uh, so now, basically, for folks who don't know, there's like it used to be. Blockers were assigned, and if there were multiple blockers on an attacker, at that point, you would order those blockers as the attacker, and then there was a step where you could cast instants, whatever, tricks, removal spells, etc. That's gone. Blocking, ordering happens at damage now. What do you think? Thoughts? Questions, well, comments, do, concerns. Yeah. So this this favors. I was thinking through it. I, like I was driving home from band, like trying to make sure I understood exactly what was going to happen. And so previously stuff favored the blocker because you had to order pre damage. And then if you ordered wrong, the blocker could do something sneaky to surprise you. That is, mm-hmm. that is no longer the case. So this favors people who like beating down. This favors the, the red white players of the universe. Yeah, this is it. This just makes, I mean, it was never really good to be using your pump spells on blocks anyway, but sometimes you could blow people out, right? You block their, whatever their four, four with your two, three, threes, and then whichever three, three they put first, you played a giant growth on it and then saved both your creatures, killed theirs. You can no longer do that because you play giant growth before damage. And then they say, OK, fine, I'll kill the other one instead. Um, so I think it's like that situation doesn't come up that much. I do think limited players are suffering the most from this. Like, I feel like this is where that comes up the most. And I think this is probably a net negative rule change in the sense of like, I, I just think like giving more agency to the attacker in that sense. Like there's already enough agency given to attackers in limited. Like, <laughs> can, can the blockers have something for once? And it feels like we're just picking on them again. But it, like, I, I feel like it's not going to come up that much. Like it didn't, it already didn't come up that much, but I don't love this as a change personally. I, I do like it. That's interesting. We're on opposite sides of the coin here. I think this just cleans up the game. Like that, that just feels like, niche and corner casey and rules lawyery this just feels more natural to me it definitely feels better for paper like that whole thing of like okay i block with these and then you're like ah, ah, ah what order is it is like okay yes yeah, sure i have to do that now when like most of the time me doing it now versus me doing it in two seconds is the same thing um so i agree with that but online like i don't know it's fine Like I said, not going to come up that much. Like this is a extremely small ball uh, rules change. Um, Let's let's chat real quick about the Patreon page. Then let's get into our world's draft prep thoughts. Um, Patreon.com slash Lords Limited is where folks can go to give back to the show. Um, We've got some great perks. Episode 400 is right around the corner. That's our we're we're doing an all musical episode, right? Ben, you wrote a a whole score for us. And I'll be I'm I'm on clarinet. You're on vocals. It's going to be hip. Um, so make sure you uh, unsubscribe before that episode drops. Um, but no, we have uh, some some cool perks uh, rolling around for episode 400. You'll see, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tease it here. You are going to see um, a little bonus episode dropped in your uh, podcast feed later on in the week. Um, and that's part of our, our changes for, for episode 400. And that's all via the Patreon and all because of our wonderful support. Uh, via the Patreon. And what we like to give back to our patrons is access to the Discord. It's hopping, it's popping, 24-7 limited tech support. I was watching Simon Nielsen's draft live on coverage and in the watch party channel um, of our Discord, just chatting with people about picks. I mean, as 
pack one, pick one is kind of wild. Excited to talk to you about that. You and I have not talked about any of these, uh, any of these drafts yet, but uh, the watch party is great. Just getting to like cheer people on. We had someone, it's been so long since we recorded because we recorded early for me being at KubeCon, but uh, it's, we had someone in our discord who's in the hero tier section who qualified for arena championships and you helped them out with their, their day two sealed deck. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Um, so that's very exciting. So getting to cheer people on there, getting to cheer people on during the arena open. And and so that's what we get to do. We get to cheer people on, but you get to reap the benefits of a community of like-minded limited individuals. We want to shout out our patrons the first week that they join. This week, we're welcoming Joseph, Alexander, and Mason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your support. Yeah. Cannot say thank you enough. So we thought before diving into the world's draft reviews that we're going to be doing today is that we do something that we we did once, got good feedback on, and then didn't quite ever stick the landing on it again, but doing some like world's prep thoughts, like coming in with some, not doing like a full, you know, pack one, pick one tier list thing that testing teams do, but like a mini testing team meeting here where we've got some ideas of some card rankings that we would come into and maybe just some general thoughts about how we might want to zag if everybody at worlds is zigging so ben the floor sir what would you do if you're sitting down at the highest stage in magic so i think we'll be coming to this with lists separate lists we've got Mm -hmm. 10 uncommons ranked one through 10 and five commons one through five as a nod to the new world order of uncommons mattering more than commons Um, and then where our top common fits in those uncommon rankings as well as just for fun uh, a cool rare or a spicy rare that you would take over I, all of your top uncommons. I already know what your answer is, but and I think oh. our listeners do too. But um, I'm glad that you have an opportunity to talk about that card once again. To wax poetic about first recording. <laughs> I love that yeah. card. Yeah, that is that is my rare. Um, mostly just an excuse to talk about that. But I do think that's uh, an underappreciated or maybe underutilized card power level wise. Not the by the reigning world champ, John Emmanuel Dupra, though. <laughs> he got there on day one, didn't he? He did, yeah. 3 0 with a Mar Dudu deck that had curse recording, and he hard cast Valgavoth on, uh, on camera. That was pretty sweet to see. Wow, I did yeah. not see that. Yeah, very, very cool. Sorry. Um, so back to, yes, thank you for laying out what we're doing today. Um, did you have any like general thoughts otherwise about like, I don't know, colors you might want to favor or strategies you might want to favor or avoid? Well, I tried to reflect that in my tier list order. I mean, it's similar for me still. I think currently I would want to draft white the least just yeah. because I feel like it gives you the least amount of agency. Like it feels like high rolling, trying to high roll a little bit more because if you get a great white blue or a great white red deck, like you're going to be in great shape. But if you get pushed into white green or white black, I'd be a little nervous about that white black less so than white green. But I basically do not want to play white green in the format yeah that's why simon's pack one pick one is so interesting i can't wait to talk to you about it um and something that's notable about my top 10 uncommon list i do not have optimistic scavenger on that list while i do think it probably exists among the top 10 best uncommons in the set it is a card that i'm like is this really what i want to be doing it feels so like i don't know all in dealer secret gold card type deal yeah, I think it's a gold card, and I think where you put the gold cards is interesting for that top uncommon list and how how willing you are to you know, go aggressively after the good gold cards, because there are a lot of good gold cards. I think that's an, an interesting discussion that'll come through um, seeing our lists here. But also, I do still, I mean, red and green seem like the two poles of the format to me a bit, but blue kind of mm. tying the rim together in the middle. Like, if I were to update my color power rankings, I think it would be red, green, blue, black, white. For me, and not that white's not powerful, but that's the order I want to start in them in the draft. Right. We got an interesting question in the Discord. Someone was saying, like, you said that you didn't like white because it only leads to white, blue, or white, red as decks you're happy with. But then you talked about black saying you're happy with all the black decks, which I like agree that is confusing as a sentiment because then you're like, wait, but it sounds like then you're happy about black, white. But I, I am happy about black, white, and I'm thinking about that as a I'm starting the draft black, and I feel like a black, white deck that is base black is going to be a lot stronger than a black, white deck that is base white, if that makes sense. Like the the cards that black has a lot of inherent synergy and then can pull the things that white adds to it, whereas vice versa, I don't feel like white can sort of tie that room together. Right. White doesn't start you down a black, white 
path. White starts Correct. you down an aggressive path. White's best cards are all aggressive and belong in the white, red, and white blue decks. Well, why don't we do top commons first? Because I feel like that'll be a, a, a shorter conversation. And then I think top on commons will be really where the meat of the discussion is. All right. So counting down from number one, number one common for me is Scorching Dragonfire, one in red, instant deal three. Uh, if the creature would die this turn, exile it instead. Yep. That's that my same number for you? one as well. Yep. Okay. So I think pretty clear there, but very interesting where Scorching Dragonfire slots in your top uncommon list, if, if at all. And... That is interesting that you said, if at all. I don't like that. I <laughs> don't like that at all. <laughs> and then number two for me, this is where it gets a little wonky. It, it's really hard after Scorching Dragonfire. Scorching Dragonfire feels like a clear number one. I, I couldn't. I went back and forth on the order of two, three, four, and five for forever. So I, and it, I, my guess is that two, three, four, and five, like we may have one card difference, but they're going to largely be similar cards. But the order is kind of up for debate i feel like but yeah maybe that's I'm a not, maybe that's a bold claim i don't know maybe you're gonna come with some hotness i'm not even confident we're gonna have the same cards number two i ended up with unable to scream uh which is the the blue swords to plowshares mm -hmm. number three spine seeker centipede it's the two one that can search up a basic land number four final vengeance uh the black sorcery is an additional cost sack creature and enchantment and then exile target creature for a single black which is just incredible and then in the number five slot, I put uh, Glimmer Light, which is the artifact, the two man artifact that makes a one one and has the equip cost to give a creature plus one plus one for one mana. So unable to scream. I mean, I feel like you're you're reflecting the color rankings that you said as well in this a little bit, right, where you were saying you felt like sort of team are at the front for you and then black and white. And so you're giving Dragonfire, unable to scream, Centipede, top billing, final vengeance, fourth Glimmer Light over the card that I have on my list that you don't, and I have, we, we do have overlap otherwise, um, over trapped in the screen is your hot take. I don't think that's that hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot? It's hot. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's bad or wrong. This is a judgment-free zone in this respect, but it's a hot take to leave trapped in the screen out of your top five commons you'd be happy taking at worlds trapped in the screen is an excellent removal spell and eminently splashable but but the but the decks that want to splash don't want to splash white that much could, could you splash trapped in the screen for sure but if you end up base green you typically want to end up in rug or soul tide yeah but also abzan is great too i think i think i think green black splash white is totally reasonable and I just think removal is such a premium and removal that hits anything. And plus the word two is relevant. Like removal in these kinds of drafts, which are going to be a little lower powered, a little scrappier because everybody knows what's up. I think trapped in the screen still has to kind of get a nod again. I'm fine with your glimmer light take. You're basically saying I don't want to draft white at worlds at this with that. I feel like, well, cer certainly not for a trapped in the screen. Like, okay. I don't want that to be the card that pushes me into white yet. I, like, yeah. will I be thrilled to pick Trapped in the Screen over Glimmerlight once I'm white? Yes. And and mm -hmm. this, but this is back to your point about commas not mattering anymore. Like, you're correct. never first picking Glimmerlight. That is correct. Yeah, that would have to be just the worst pack. Yeah. So my list is Dragonfire 1, Final Vengeance 2, Unable to Scream 3, Trapped in the Screen 4, Spine Seeker Centipede 5, and I gave an honorable mention to terramorphic expanse um over glimmer light just as a, i think a nod to expecting my deck to be a little scrappier and wanting to open up the option to splash those single pipped removal spells yeah my other i also had uh evolving wilds as an oli is it not evolving wilds in this format it is actually not expanse? it's not evolving wilds welcome to dusk morn it's terramorphic <laughs> expanse thank you for playing <laughs> I could not have answered that question. <laughs> like if you if you told me my life was on the line, like life or death, which one's in the you format? Would have died. You thought it was Evolving Wilds. I, no, I just would have had a 50-50 shot and Evolving Wilds would have been the name that came to mind. Because <laughs> I don't think about it as Terramorphic Expanse ever. Oh, uh, to have, have a 24-hour <laughs> stint inside your brain just to see what's going on up there. <laughs> the other two OLIs I had were uh, Glasswork Shattered Yard, the, the Red Enchantment Deal 4, and then Glimmer Burst. I kind of felt like I should try to get Glimmer Burst in my top five. The three and a blue yeah. instant speed, draw two cards, make a 1-1. One, one. 
that was tough for me to leave out. I, I went back and forth on that, putting that versus Glimmer Light in the common mm. slot. And I, I do think Glimmer Burst is a higher power level card, but Glimmer Light also just fit, being a two drop that you can play in any deck is, mm -hmm. are you happy to play it on turn two? No, but like you need some twos. It's not the saddest thing in the world. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good shout. I like that. Thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring this episode. Did you know traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat, which can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses? Plus, it's just plain gross. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self cleaning antibacterial bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters, that prevent up to 99.7% of bacteria growth and require three times less laundry. Miracle Made sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver infused fabrics that are temperature regulating so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. The weather has turned. We're in peak fall here in Pittsburgh. That means one night we've got the heat on, the next we've got the windows open, the next they're closed again. But Miracle Made's temperature regulating sheets are keeping me cozy no matter what. Miracle Made sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five star hotels. Go to trymiracle.com slash LOL to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code LOL at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. If you aren't 100% satisfied, Miracle has a 30-day money-back guarantee. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash LOL and use code LOL to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash LOL to treat yourself. And now, back to the show. Okay. Top on comments. How do we want to do this? One person think, does their list. I think we should go, one person go through their list completely, and then the other person, if that card is in their list, they should say, yeah, that's in my list. It's number blank on my list. Great. Okay. You're up. I'm up. All right. Number one uncommon in Duskmorn. Unnerving Grasp. This is two and a blue for a sorcery. Uh, manifest red, make a two, two, and then you can return target permanent to its owner's hand. Target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. That's on my list. That's number four on my list. Ooh, I like it. Okay. I have just been wildly impressed with this card. A and blues uncommons have just been incredible. And I think this letting you leverage tempo in the games, the games that go longer, like where somebody doesn't just get steamrolled by blue, white or white, red. And this is also insane in blue, white, by the way. But the games where somebody doesn't just get steamrolled, getting to interact with your opponent's four five or six drop that just doesn't do much the turn that they play it like their seven, six trample or their five, five menace thing. Like that's just game winning when you cast unnerving grasp in that spot. And I've, I've been crazy impressed with it. And there's non-zero amount of synergistic cards with this as well in terms of manifest. And so like that also adds a layer like it's, it's that plus plus, you know, it's, it's really good. Well, and the other thing that this and my number two card on this list is under the skin, the two in a green manifest red return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. The other thing that both of these cards do is sorcery is kind of a weirdly hard type to get in mm. some delirium decks. So these plus binning a thing Plus, when the card that you hit dies, like oftentimes you can get three types in the yard pretty trivially easy on mm -hmm. what is a card that is powerful. Like It's not like you're having to put, you know, a 2-2 two -two teddy bear in your deck that you don't really want to play to try to get Delirium. These are these are great cards that give you a kind of underappreciated type while also really speeding you up to Delirium. Under the Skin is on my list as well, and it's also number two. Ooh, interesting. I want to know what your number one is so badly now. We're going to we're going to hit it, I'm, right? I'm a sheeple. You know what my number one is. Oh, your number one is Disturbing Birth. No, no. no. that's not a sheeple pick. We're blowing it. Just just keep going. You keep going. <laughs> OK, uh, number three for me. Fear of Isolation, the white blue two three flying enchantment creature. Whenever it enters the battlefield, you can return. You have to pick up. Well, you can. You have the option to pick up another creature or enchantment. That card has been crazy impressive as far as a value engine. And again, under two types on a creature, can reset things that are under enchantment removal, can pick up rooms. It's not a two drop. Like you want to think about it as a four or a five drop or a double spelling. Like it doesn't count towards your curve, but it is crazy powerful. Fear of Isolation is also on my list. It is number five. Number five. Okay. Number four for me. This is where we, my first gold card, make wow. an appearance. 
Main appearance early. This is Brood Spinner, black green for the 2 3, ETB surveil 2, and then you can pay 6 to crack it to make always 6 1 1 flying instance. <laughs> yes, yes. No matter where you are or what deck it's in, it's making 6 1 1s. Um, Brood Spinner is also on my list. It's number 8. Okay, okay. And four, I, th- four, I th- for 4 and overlap here. 4 4 and overlap here. Did you look at 17 lands for yours? I actually didn't. I also did not look at seventeen lands for mine. Yeah. I did not did not open it, so I didn't didn't want to be infected by the by the yeah. sheeple thought. Yeah, I, I, it was already it was already wormed into me for my number one. So don't you worry. Uh, so brood spinner for me, I I have some gold cards here that are green because mm. I think the green ones are much less committing than the others. I think this is basically a mono colored card for me. Like if I end up green, if I take brood spinner, I'm going to try pretty hard to end up base green. And then whether or not I end up pairing black with it, Brood Spinner is going to make my deck with some mana fixing, ideally. Yeah, I like it. So similar thought, number five, Oblivious Bookworm. If you told me at the start of the format I've had Brood Spinner above Oblivious Bookworm, I'd have told you you were crazy. But I, I do think uh, I've been more impressed with the spider. As a, as The spider is a similar amount of value almost, but a better win condition than the right. Bookworm, I think. Yeah. And and dare, dare I say, am I allowed to say in a better deck? Also, like black, black green better than blue green. They're just similar to me. It's all okay. all the, all that all that all delirium soup. stuff. Green is soupy. Soup, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Oblivious Book- Bookworm is on my list as well. It's number ten. Wow. Okay. So we got Brood Spinner Bookworm, uh, and then number six, first black card making an appearance. Osseus Stick Twister, one in a black for the two two Life Link, uh, artifact creature, and if you've got Delirium, it drains and gains at the end of the turn if your opponent doesn't discard a card or sack a permanent. We've come to our first card that is not on my list. Whoa. Yeah. And you love green black. How is this not on your list? We'll we'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. 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 I'm intrigued. Love Osseus Stick Twister. I have huge respect for that card. Number seven, Sheltered by Ghosts. One in a white for the aura. Uh, gives your creature ward to and lifelink. And whenever it enters, you yoink something off the opponent's side of the battlefield until your creature leaves the battlefield. Sheltered by Ghosts is on my list, and it is number one. Oh, get out of here. That's so boring. That's what I said. It's a sheeple pick. I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Sheltered by Ghosts, it's a good it's card. A, this is too this much is... of a zag for me to be like, am I really going to like, I just couldn't really see myself. It felt like I was leveling myself to not take that as the best uncommon, personally. I didn't know that it was, is it, is it noticeably that high in the 17 lands power rankings? I haven't looked in a long time. It was, it's so powerful. It's really it's, good. It's so powerful. It's, really, it's a really good card, but I think for me, I would be resistant to drafting. I think that's why it's lower on my list mm-hmm. because like if I start with it or I stop with, start with optimistic scavenger, which is number eight on my list, by the way. Um, so those, those two back to back, there's seven and eight because I had to make myself think pretty long and hard about what I would do, pack one, pick one. Um, I think I would take both of those over some of the other cards on my list, pack one, pick one, if push came to shove. But they're lower than those other six cards because if if I start sheltered by ghosts and then have the opportunity to take brood spinner, like I'm taking brood spinner and jumping ship. Like I don't want to draft yeah. white, and so like I should just lean into not wanting to draft white. I think given the opportunity, I would faced with any of those other six cards versus sheltered by ghosts. And maybe I'm taking a hit and win percentage, like uh, in theory, but I think for me, for the way I want to draft the format, it's a better choice for me to take those other six cards over Sheltered by Ghosts. Yeah, I buy it. So Sheltered by Ghosts 7, Optimistic Scavenger 8. Did that make mm-hmm. it make the cut for you? Not on my list. Not on your list. Interesting that Sheltered by Ghosts is that high, but then you didn't put Optimistic Scavenger in there. I feel like sh- Sheltered by Ghosts, like Optimistic Scavenger is in my mind blue white. Can it be good in red white? Yes. Can you make it work in black white? Probably. Probably can't make it work in green white. So like it's effectively in my mind a blue white gold card, whereas sheltered by ghosts like is just going in any white aggressive deck and any deck that I start drafting a sheltered by ghosts in is going to lean that way and so I just don't feel like I have to jump through hoops. That was sort of my reasoning about like not putting any other white cards in my uncommon list. Spoiler, then Sheltered by Ghosts was just like, I know what I know how to make this card work, and I know it's not going to ask a lot of me. I don't want to put myself in a spot where I'm like, like what you said, like taking something like Optimistic Scavenger and then being like, ooh, Brood Spinner. 
Like, you know, I don't want to have to, and certainly I would make that pick if there was nothing else good in the pack, but you know, sheltered by ghosts, I feel like gives me a, a clearer direction. That's fair. Number nine for me, gremlin tamer, the first non green gold car. This is the blue white, uh, two, two with eerie that poops out one ones. And here post gremlin tamer is where I would slot in scorching dragon fire on my top. Wow. Wow. I think I would take all nine of those other cards over over scorching dragon fire. Interesting. Okay. And then what's your number 10? My number 10 is patchwork beastie. That's where I, I drew the line for. I would not take that over scorching dragon fire. That's the single green three, three artifact creature at the beginning of rep keep. You have the option to mill. And then when you hit delirium, it can start attacking or blocking. And then my honorable mention here uh, is disturbing mirth. I, I couldn't quite, I think faced between that and scorching dragon fire pack one, pick one. I think I would take Scorching Dragon Fire over it. I had it higher on the list, and then when I started, my list changed quite a bit after I thought, okay, pack one, pick one, Scorching Dragon Fire versus this card. What am I taking? And that was where I really started to dial in, dial in on the list for myself. Yeah, my list is a little. It's, I like your list is better. Your list is better. Um, but I've got <laughs> I've got some cards that I'd like to talk about. Disturbing Mirth is uh, is on is on my list. You said that was your honorable mention. Yeah. Okay, so my list is number one, Sheltered by Ghosts, number two, Under the Skin, number three, Painter Studio Defaced Gallery. Ooh, not on my list at all. That didn't even make my outside looking in. I know, I know. Um, This is probably a hot take, probably doesn't belong this high up in the the list. I think this card is extremely powerful, and I love it in any red deck, and I do feel like I am the most comfortable drafting red decks in the format, like... That's why Scorching Dragonfire is my number one. Um, Painter Studio versus Scorching Dragonfire. Like, I should probably take Dragonfire over it just based on what I feel like is important at a draft of this caliber is having interaction and interaction that's cheap and premium like Dragonfire and Exiles. Um, But I have it a little lower in this list right now, so bear with me. So then I have Unnerving Grasp number four. The Bounce Spell, Fear of Isolation number five, the blue flyer that picks up an enchantment, um, or a permanent rather. Um, And then there is where I would slot in Dragonfire after number five. Below that, I have two removal spells, Nowhere to Run, the black enchantment minus three, minus three. Okay. And Betrayer's Bargain, the uh, four mana deal five or two mana plus sack something, deal five, exile it. And then I have my gold cards, Brood Spinner, Disturbing Mirth, Oblivious Bookworm. I put a like I just felt like when push came to shove, like you said, like really trying to think, all right, pack one, pick one. What am I doing? Yeah, Brood Spinner has a higher ceiling for sure than something like Scorching Dragonfire, than these single colored interactive spells. But I think those are as important and then more likely to make my deck or more likely to make my draft navigation just slightly easier that I didn't want to put the gold cards super high on this list. I I feel like you're giving up a little bit by not taking, you really wouldn't take brute spinner over scorching dragon fire pack one, pick one. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Like in a normal draft. Sure. At worlds, I think like, and it's, and it's unfortunate. I didn't, you know, I was, I was watching worlds yesterday and I was like, Oh man, I haven't really done any like single limbs. And then I went to see if they were firing on Magic Online, and of course they weren't, because anyone who was <laughs> playing in them was at Worlds. In the world, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I know that like those environments do feel slightly differently from doing so many of them leading up to prepping for um, PT Chicago. Um, so I'm just sort of like trying to carry over some of that feeling of like, and, and maybe these gold cards are built different, etc. Like I said, I, I like your list and reasoning a little bit more, but I do think there's something to be said for the the like uh, identifying what the monocolored interactive spells are that you just got to take. So one thing I would push back on about nowhere to run and betrayer's bargain. So the way I did this was I just I, I went on scryfall and I just listed every common I thought uncommon and uncommon I thought might be in consideration for the list and then looked at those cards and then dialed in on one through 10. So I just left the cards that didn't make my list and nowhere to run and betrayer's bargain are both outside looking in for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, my thought process was red and black both get so much good removal that I, th- I think it is a bit less of a priority for those colors. Like you're going to end up with final vengeances or worst case scenario murders or glassworks shattered yard. Like 
it's not you're not going to be in a spot of your black and red where you don't end up with stuff. And both Scorching Dragonfire and Final Vengeance at Common fit the Exile bill. I I don't think Nowhere to Run and Betrayer's Bargain are quite quite that much of a premium because of the cards they're surrounded by in their colors. I buy that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So I just want to run through the other cards that didn't make the cut for me real mm-hmm. quick. So bottomless pool, locker room, that's the single blue bounce spell. And then locker room is the five mana. If one of your creatures hits them, you get a draw card. I, I feel like this card's a bit underappreciated at the moment or that I seem higher on it than most people. I think this card is premium in any blue deck. Just the, the single blue bounce part that's an enchantment you're already interested in. And then locker room, your opponent just has to be constantly worrying about when you might unlock it. Yeah. Once it's sitting on the battlefield without you actually having to spend the five mana to unlock it. It's a very cool threat of looming over your opponent. I really like that. Stay hidden, stay silent was in contention for me. Also didn't quite make the cut. I had that one initially on there. And then really? I finally decided I would take Scorching Dragonfire over it, pack one, pick one. And then I, that kind of bumped it out of consideration for me. I, I've gone I stay hidden, say I stay silent is fine to me. I've gone significantly lower on it like i think unable to scream is better than it it's close they're similar cards I, that yeah. wouldn't shock me or surprise me yeah i yeah. could buy that and then threats around every corner i initially had on the list that's the four man enchantment uh, that lets you manifest and when you manifest you get a search of a basic that was initially on there but then i think i would pick scorching dragon fire over that pack one pick one and again that pushed it lower on my list pushed it yeah. out of contention uh, break down the door. That's the two in a green instant speed. Exile an artifact or an enchantment, and then manifest dread. That I got some eyes there for those of you who are. I mean, audio just look at you said Painter Studio to Face Gallery didn't make your outside looking in list, and this card did. That's crazy to me. I'm too low on uh, Painter's Painter's Gallery to Face Studio should probably be on this list. Yeah, you're, yeah. yeah that's a good card. And then Arabella Abana Doll was the the best gold card that I mm-hmm. didn't put put in the list. Yeah, we, I think I'm looking at my list. I had 17 cards that uh, in my first pass of Scryfall that I found. The only card that we haven't mentioned so far that's here. Oh, we actually two cards that we haven't mentioned. Sporogenic Infection. I like Ooh, a lot. I like that. Um, yeah. The uh, the sort of edict enchantment in black and a reverent gremlin. The two mana, two, two menace in red that uh, any small creature enters. You get to rummage if you want um, once per turn. I think that card's very good, but. Just ultimately didn't didn't make the list. A lot of banger on commons. Did you watch Simon's games? Yeah. Did you, his sporogenic infection was incredible for him. And his uh, opponent uh, blocked into the first striker with the sporogenic infection creature. Oh man, lord! I feel like I've been just like off on an island for weeks talking about that card. Like I draft that in on on stream or in videos, and people are like, "What's happening?" And like every time I draw it, it's amazing. It just like <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Every time you see it, um, it's really hard for that card not to be great. Uh, Speaking of, shall we talk about Simon's draft? Let's get into it. Yeah. Okay. So Simon Nielsen sits down day one, draft one of worlds and sees the following cards as option. I cannot wait to talk to you about this pack one. Pick one commons. He's got a glassworks shattered yard. He's got an unable to scream. Uncommons break down the door, the naturalize or manifest for three mana. Vile Mutilator, not really in consideration. The Black 7 drop. Diversion Specialist, the 4 mana, 4, 3 menace in red that you can sack stuff to do the like red exile, play it until end of turn thing. And his rare is Reluctant Role Model, the 1 and a white 2 2. If it survives, you can put a plus and plus 1 flying or lifelink counter on it. And then whenever any creature you control dies, you can dump its counters onto another creature. I always forget. I always forget when my opponent's playing with this card that like trading with something else with a plus one plus one counter is going to then end up on one of their creatures as well. Yeah. Speaking of that interaction with Reluctant Roll Model, I saw a tweet from Alex where patched play thing. If you have minus one, minus one counters on it, your Reluctant Roll Model will dump those minus one, minus one counters on an opposing creature. Have not seen or even come close to thinking about that interaction, this format. It's pretty gnarly. It's pretty gnarly. Reluctant Roll Model is... Very, very good, but it is white. It is white. I mean, this was shocking to me. I I would take reluctant role model pack one, pick one here. And I I don't I like I'm pretty low on white. I think the thing I wish I could ask Simon was, is this because reluctant role model says survival on it. And I know everybody's low on survival, but this is just a 
good card. That, yes. And you're going to be playing combat tricks alongside it. And once you get it in once, it do, it can snowball like pretty heavily, unlike acrobatic cheerleader or whatever. But I could see looking at this card. Well, it's just kind of acrobatic cheerleader. And that card is not very good. You know, I want to dive into Simon's brain and think, is this because he thinks this card is like acrobatic cheerleader? Ergo, it is not very good. Or is it because he doesn't want to draft white? Or is it some combination of the two? Because for me, I would take it because I think this card is powerful and I would just be kind of bummed that I were drafting white. But that's the thing. So, I mean, first of all, you should just tweet at Simon because like he likes us and likes our show and he would happily reply to you. Um, But two, that's my guess is that this is a nod to not wanting to be white because my feeling is similar to you is like, I think I would have taken reluctant role model and not been happy and either been upset about drafting white in this seat (laughs) or have or like be easily pushed off of it and i think both of those are like bad spots to be in like if you're gonna take this you gotta be like oh great i've got reluctant role model this is what i'm drafting this is what i'm doing if you're not feeling that way i kind of like i mean simon takes unable to scream which was perhaps the most shocking pick of both drafts to me (laughs) Honestly, <laughs> um, I, that, that is not true for me. No, I guess. Yeah, I can think of one from JED that was quite shocking. But yeah, I, I was very surprised to see him take on able to scream. But I feel like it says a lot about what he and Team Handshake were thinking about doing going into these drafts. Like this shows yeah. a, an, an opinion beyond just individual card quality. For sure. Either that or they don't have a high opinion of reluctant role model. It's good. Could be that. As yeah. well, because I think you could make that case that this is kind of like, but what grade would you give reluctant role model right now? B, B plus. Like I, I think I would give it a B plus. Yeah. yeah, like it would be it would be tough for me to not take reluctant role model, but I think I would take it and assume I am drafting white, red or white, blue. That would be that would be my thought process. Yes, right. Yeah, you're not again still feeling how we are about like not wanting to draft white, black. And it seemed like both Marshall and Paul were also on this. Um, from commentary that like white green is probably just the, the worst stat. Like you just really don't want to draft that Correct. in the format. Yeah. So taking on able to scream here. Love it. I mean, I was like, yeah, you too. You, I was, yeah. I was applauding. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Pack one, pick two. There's a monstrous emergence, the green bite spell. There's a scorching dragon fire, red deal three uncommons coordinated clobber ben's other favorite bite spell at a <laughs> single green uh bottomless pool actual ben's favorite uh bounce spell room fear of infinity the one blue black two two flying lifelink can't block can recur it to your hand with eerie and my fave painter studio defaced gallery the you know three mana look at the top two or exile the top two and you can play them until the end of your next turn and um defaced gallery is one in a red for attacking creatures you control get plus one plus oh. Yeah, this is interesting here. I think if I had taken Reluctant Role Model, I would be slamming Scorching Dragon Fire. Yes. If I had started with Unable to Scream like Simon, it's a really hard pick for me between Bottomless Pool and Scorching Dragon Fire. And I think I ultimately would have ended up on Bottomless Pool over Scorching Dragon Fire. That does not surprise me to hear you say that. Because I know you're how high you are on that card. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, I'm just not surprised. But I'm not surprised that Simon took Dragonfire here. H- hard for that to be wrong. Well, but it puts you into a second color. Either that or you're just like, to me, taking Scorching Dragonfire here says, I really want to be red, like more than I want to be blue. Like, I don't mind branching out into a second color here. Correct. He's not giving, I mean, as we say, like, just not giving weight to Unable to Scream. The common Correct. doesn't get get weight for him here. And it's you are giving it a little weight because like pack one, pick one. You're definitely taking dragon fire over bottomless pool, right? Yes, per yes. my per my per the official world's pick order tier list. Yes, I'm taking dragon fire over bottomless pool, but unable to scream is my second common, right? And it's like fairly close to scorching dragon fire. And that's where color preferences start to come in for me. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I get that. I just think like yeah, dragon fire is just so good. Yeah, and I don't think this is wrong, to be clear. No, no. Like, yeah, I yeah. certainly think this is a defensible pick. I just think I would have taken Bottomless Pool over Dragonfire. Yeah. Um, pick three with the two removal spells in his pile. There's a blue-green dual land. There's a bashful beastie. The five mana, five, four dies manifest dread. Uncommons, there's a cursed windbreaker. 
the three mana equipment manifest red equipped creature gets flying patchwork beastie the single green three three can't attack or block unless you have delirium and you mill you may mill one in your upkeep and live or die the five mana either kill something or reanimate at instant speed yeah i think clear best card in the pack is patchwork beastie and so for simon still trying to feel out his lane lane here with unable to scream scorching dragon fire i definitely like patchwork beastie i think if i had gone unable to scream in the bottomless pool i think i would take cursed windbreaker over patchwork beastie here is cursed windbreaker a good card it's not a bad card <laughs> i i would not put my foot down and say it's a good card but i would definitely in the, say in it's the words not a bad of card. tim of tim walls that is a damning non-answer sir um <laughs> it's not good though right like you just it can't like, be good. There's some times when it's great. It's randomly great. It's randomly great. I just feel like you have no shortage of three mana two two opportunities. But in this you format. also have bottomless pool, which is one of the spots where it's great. Like if you unlock a locker uh, room, have a windbreaker on a thing like that's uh, not nothing. It's pretty good. OK. All right. That's not nothing. You've got a you've got an interesting path here. Mono blue. Um, but Simon does take the beastie, as you said to just sort of feel out his lane. And I feel like we should probably f- move, move away from Ben's mono blue path just for the sake of our <laughs> listeners. Um, so he's got a blue card, a red card and a green card here. Pick four. There's a fear of surveillance, the white two drop two, two Vigi. Um, when it attacks, you surveil one. There's a final vengeance, the single black removal spell. There's right of the moth, the black, white reanimate spell with flashback and another painter studio defaced gallery yeah this is interesting here i think between final vengeance and painter studio pretty quickly Mm -hmm. i don't think you quite want to branch into your fourth color at this spot in the draft but and painter studio is probably still just better than final vengeance so i I think probably taking painter studio but noting a fourth pick final vengeance is not nothing that's the other thing that we didn't dive into in the commons of our list that i wanted to talk Mm. about is Final Vengeance just like pulling you into black at this point? Like you're willing to pick Final Vengeance without cards that go along with it yet, correct? Right. Well, because you have, as as you kind of see from like JED's Day 2 draft, like you don't have to be doing the black-red thing to make Final Vengeance work. He had like a ton of, uh, what are they called? Like underwater tunnels, slimy aquariums. And those are just rooms that are just... Once they're done, they're done, and that's fodder for you to sack to your final vengeance. I just don't think it's hard, especially the first one, to make that card work. Right. Yeah. Um, so yes, final vengeance is as much as I'm letting a common pull me into a color, is pulling me into black. That just goes against my nature with that type of card historically. Correct. Like so it's it I have really have to make myself make a mental shift to be willing to take final vengeance aggressively like that. Rooms make it a lot easier. And if you're thinking about sporogenic infection and to a lesser extent cracked skull as really premium cards. And then they're like cracked skull is not premium, but it's a card that like you can get negligibly on the wheel and then is going to turn that on and probably gets better in these kinds of drafts anyway, just like Taking the the best thing, you know, if someone's got a scrappier deck, but some bombs, taking that out of their hand can be nice. Um, But yeah, I think this is a pretty clear painter studio as a follow up to the dragon fire he took two picks ago. Pick five, there's a glimmer light, the equipment getting getting into some lower powered stuff. Tunnel surveyor, blue three drop makes a one one terramorphic expanse and the uncommons. There's a fear of being hunted. The one red red four two haste has to be blocked. And sporogenic infection, the edict enchantment in black. Yeah, this is a, a clear fear of being hunted again because you like you you're looking for a direction at this point. If you're Simon, the packs have been pretty low powered. Fear of being hunted is a signal. It gives you your third red card. That is, all three of these are premiums: Scorching Dragon, Fire Painter Studio, Fear of Being Hunted. Like you'd like the power level to be a little higher, ideally, but you want to lock in at this point. Okay, I am red. Great. Lock me in on that and I'll stay open to whatever my second color is going to be in pack two. But along with taking fear of being hunted here, I'd be noting the sporogenic infection. And this is now back to back packs. You've gotten past a a premium black card. Like, would you like to be able to take sporogenic infection here over fear of being hunted? Probably like you're just not in a position to be able to do so. But while you're feeling out what your second color might be, you're noting that black is flowing from your right. I really am looking for any reason to not take fear of being hunted. I can't quite come up with a good one. I just don't 
really like this card very much anymore. Like it's fine. And I agree with you, like getting deeper into a color is worth it. But I'm like, can I justify taking glimmer light here? Can I justify taking Terramorphic Expanse here? I, I don't think you can. I don't I, think, I think you can, a- but like this card is not like the whole this is I mean, it's a preview for 50 takes whenever that is. If it's next week, two weeks from now. But like the fear of being hunted, most valuable slayer thing that like everyone was excited about week one. It's like fine, but th- those two cards are extremely greater than the sum of their par- <laughs> their parts. Like, I'm not really excited about either of those cards anymore. I agree. Fear of being hunted is like it's like a C plus or something. May- yeah. Maybe a C, but it, yeah. like, if you're a dedicated red aggressive deck, it's powerful. It's randomly insane sometimes when your opponent plays like the green O four or yeah, whatever. Play a paranormal analyst and you eat it. Yeah. And and more than anything else, it's also two types for this patchwork beastie you also have. Like, it's a good card that is two types for the red green deck. You, mm-hmm. you can't take anything over fear of being hunted here. I, I agree. I agree. I'm just saying I'd like to, if possible. Um, pick six, he takes a smoky lounge, misty salon, the blue red room over really nothing. I think the other card, I don't even know what it's called, but like the green four mana, four, four survival gain two life. Like there was this pack was extremely weak. And I assume he's taking smoky lounge and not giving it much weight like he does have painter studio he does have unable to scream but i got the sense that that blue red was kind of a maligned archetype much like green white was yeah i mean you're happy to pick it up here out of a weak pack just to keep an avenue open but i think it's a a path you're hoping to not have to go down well again and he's just looking for ceilings like he's got reasonable floors of cards right unable to scream scorching dragon fire painter studio and so Smoky Lounge gives him a possible ceiling and seeing it pick six is not like it's not crazy to think that that means blue red is open at the table. Right. Pick seven. There's a bedhead beastie, the red mana cycler, five, six menace. There's a pyroclasm deal two to all creatures. There's a fear of lost teeth, single black one, one enchantment. When it dies, ping something and winter's intervention, two mana deal two, gain two in black. This is an interesting pick and I think a really cool pick you Mm -hmm. you could say like get deeper into red take bedhead beastie take pyroclasm for the sideboard you know you're playing best of three it has a chance to be a really strong card i like fear of lost teeth here as a nod to i'm looking for my second color i've seen final vengeance and sporogenic infection picks four and five like my cards that i have my red cards that i have would do well in a low curve red black deck fear of lost teeth is an important piece to the red black deck I like starting to hedge into red black here. Yeah, over a sort of nothing burger in my mind in Bedhead Beastie. That's the other option, right? To like delay the decision, get deeper into red, etc. Yeah, but I, yeah. like ultimately Bedhead Beastie is not going to make or break your draft and not having fear of lost teeth. If you do end up red black could make or break your draft. Yeah, I agree. Uh, rounding out the pack here, pick eight. He gets a blue red land. On the wheel, pick nine, he gets a Ragged Playmate, the two mana, two, two in red artifact creature that like pays one tap, makes something unblockable. That's a nice pickup for him. Yeah, you're thrilled to see that on the wheel, like because mm-hmm. I, I would be worried about red being pretty contested at, right. the, at the world's level and like seeing Ragged Playmate on the wheel would be like, OK, great. Plus, it also gives you your second artifact for the patchwork beastie. If you're going red, green, like just a great pickup. And then he does get a Winter's Intervention pick 10, the deal two. A turn inside out pick 11 is awesome for him. The plus three plus oh, if the creature dies, manifest. Ripchin Razorkin pick 12, the five three reach. And Baleful Leech, the black two drop, um, eerie. I always think this drains, but it doesn't. It just, they lose a life. That's it. So uh, eerie, lose a life. And then a Swamp pick 14. Swamp pick 14, signal that black's open. <laughs> I don't think so. But just looking at these picks, so you've got Unable to Scream, Dragonfire, Patrick Beastie, Painter Studio, Fear of Being Hunted, Smoky Lounge, Fear of Lost Teeth, and then some more some more red filler. You've just, you're essentially mono red with feelers out into blue, green, and black. I wonder if Simon wishes he took the reluctant role model at the end of pack one, because that was what I was thinking. I was thinking initially, I wouldn't have done it. I would have taken reluctant role model, and I think I would have I would have been happy having reluctant role model at the end of pack one, the way his pack one played out. But then if you have reluctant role model, I don't know if you're still going to make feelers. I think I would have let reluctant role model like juke me into not drafting red black, which is where Simon ends up. (laughs) I agree. I like, that's what I'm saying is I think you would have like 
I would have drafted it and not been happy. And it's tough to know because like the cards that Simon didn't pull any white cards to the front. So I'm only listing cards that like seemed like he was considering slash maybe a card or two that stuck out to me as I was watching the draft. There aren't white cards here. Fear of surveillance is like the only one. Yeah, white white wasn't very open. It did definitely felt like somebody so, near him was in white or white blue pretty heavily. And black did seem to be flowing. I just I I think it might have train wrecked my draft. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard because everything is so flat. It's hard to jump ship for it or or from it, right? You're not getting a, a signal here. And so you're probably good. It's it's it is ostensibly especially if you think it's better than the commons. Like if you think role models better than Dragonfire or Painter Studio, like it's the best card you see the whole pack one. So of course you're going to give it weight. That's why I'm so curious to see what he feels. So I'll tweet at him. I'm so curious to see if he feels like it's a not one in draft white thing or like the intrinsic power level of reluctant role model. If, if we're too high on it, or if I'm too high on it. So with, you know, getting deep into red feelers into basically just black though. He's got the patchwork beastie as a feeler into green, unable to scream as a feeler into blue, but that was his first pick. And then no blue cards past that other than the smoky lounge, misty salon pack to a pretty clear irreverent gremlin for him over like oblivious bookworm charred foyer was his mythic. Unfortunately, not going to take that there. Um, that's the, the mythic room that four mana is like the draw spell exile, the top card of your library you can play it this turn. And then six mana is once each turn, you can, play a card from exile for zero. Um, but yeah, Reverend Gremlin is an awesome pickup here for him. Like I obviously he'd like something maybe a little more powerful, but a top uncommon in your color is, is nice. Yeah. Then he gets past razor can needlehead, the red, red two, two has first strike on your turn. And when your opponent draws a card, it deals a damage to them getting deeper into red, getting more aggressive. This is great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And then pick three is, a big decision time. He has big decision the, time. He has the choice between scorching dragon fire number two and disturbing mirth, the red black enchantment. When it enters, you can sack something. If you do draw two, and then when you sacrifice it, you manifest dread. I, like this, this is where I think reluctant role model would have train wrecked my draft. Because I think, you, I think if I had reluctant role model, like I would have largely taken the same path as Simon through pack one except for having a reluctant role model instead of an unable to scream. But I think if I have reluctant role model and I'm putting the weight on it that I have mentally, whether correctly or incorrectly, I think I would lead me to take scorching dragon fire here over disturbing mirth. Despite I would have clocked the final vengeance and the sporogenic infection in pack one, I think, but I, I don't think I would have been brave enough to take disturbing mirth here over dragon fire. If I had reluctant role model. Now I, I got to say, I am, a, I was expecting you even without the the role model pick, I was expecting you. I didn't know where you were. I was expecting you to perhaps think that that taking Dragonfire here was correct, even with Simon's path. With Simon's path, I, I still think I would have taken Dragonfire. I don't think I would have had. Oh, okay. I don't think I would have had the guts to take Disturbing Mirth, even with Simon's path. Yeah. Uh, okay. So because I love so Simon does take the Mirth here. I love the pick. I love. I, the I'm pick. sure you. I'm sure you would make the same pick as well. I would. I don't have as much experience with black red to, I think, be comfortable making this this pick in such a high leverage spot, despite like thinking that like red black's probably where he should end up. I, I like the pick. I just don't know if I could have done it you, in the heat of battle. You're also going to like in the world where you take the role model, you're also going to get a good deck in a couple picks, which is what, what makes this middle of pack two so interesting. So Simon decides i think that like to step inside his head a little bit certainly you could tweet at him and he would you know have a better insight into what he was thinking but i feel like he's he knows what his base color is he knows he's red and he is looking desperately for a direction and had sprinklings as you said of saw the final vengeance saw the sporogenic infection got the fear of lost teeth seventh got winner's intervention tenth i think all of that adds up to Disturbing, like if you're hashtag delaying the decision, what is it for? If not for a pick three in pack two, disturbing mirth, when you've already got feelers into black. Yeah, I mean, and this is a, a masterclass in delaying the decision, like picking up on some muddy signals in pack mm -hmm. one that aren't, aren't the clearest, but are there. And then just getting paid off in pack three. And now you might make this decision and not always get paid off in pack three. 
but he set himself up to get lucky and then did, which is so beautiful. Correct. So the 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 there's something interesting that happens two picks later. So pick four, he gets a sporogenic infection, which is just chef's kiss after getting the disturbing mirth. But then pick five, he does see a midnight mayhem, which I think like there's a lot of like, uh, if I had taken Scorching Dragonfire, then I could take Midnight Mayhem here and swing back to Red White. But once he makes the disturbing mirth pick, because I was talking to some folks in the Discord about this as well, I was like, whoa, I can't believe he ends up taking Violent Urge over Midnight Mayhem here. Pick five, which is the single red, plus one plus oh, and first strike. And if you have uh, Delirium, it gets double strike instead. Once you make the disturbing mirth pick, you can't take Mayhem here, I don't think. Because like when you do, what's the plan? Are you going to keep waffling keep between waffling, and, right? keep waffling and have no deck? Going to keep waffling and be Mardu? Going to decide to be Mayhem and throw away the Mirth pick? Like, I don't think any of those are good that good of options, personally. And I think I probably would have taken Impossible Inferno. I'm not a huge fan of Violent Urge, but Violent Urge did end up, did end up um, cheesing out a game or two for Simon. Well, and also, I'm curious as to your thoughts on this. I, I'm probably still too low on Midnight Mayhem, like <laughs> six weeks into the format or however far we are in here. <laughs> But I would rather have a disturbing mirth and be on track for red black than I would rather have reluctant role model and oh. midnight mayhem. It's more about midnight mayhem appearing fifth plus. I'm not jazzed about any of the other cards. If this is Arabella, like the conversation is much different for me still. So I, I'm still where I was weeks ago when I was like, I don't really get the love for midnight mayhem. I think Arabella is better. Still feel that way. But midnight mayhem is good and certainly signal it. It's certainly Adjacent. a signal. Yeah, here. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that's a little, uh, dicey for him as, as the pack ends is like pick eight, there's a veteran survivor, the white one drop two one pick nine. He grabs an acrobatic cheerleader. So like, he, I feel like the, what doesn't end up working out for him in this pack is like, is the disturbing mirth pick, but then it works out in spades in pack three. Yeah, opens up a terrible pack with turn inside out as his pack one pick one, which you're super bummed about if you're Simon. But then this is where he gets paid off for reading that red black was open to his right, despite some kind of weak signals. Gets an undead sprinter, pick two, slams it. That's the two two zombie that uh, if a non zombie creature died this turn, you can cast it out of your graveyard and it comes into play with a plus one plus one counter on it. It's got haste the cards. Ridiculous. Pick three gets a final vengeance. Pick four gets another undead sprinter pick five gets another final vengeance picks up a couple of ticket booths to sack to his final vengeances to or bin to his undead sprinters and yep. the the undead sprinters were not shy in the gameplay and he crushed with his deck it was a very low curve like i think his curve stopped at three it was a very low curve mm -hmm. uh, red black deck got a late vicious clown at the end of pack three then ended up making the cut as well had triple fear of lost teeth which i assume he was not thrilled about but just needed a creature count a little higher and that's where the painter studio defaced gallery you know that makes the fear of lost teeth a lot yeah. more palatable if those are attacking his two ones plus he's got double turn inside out like the fear of lost teeth are like fine here would he rather they were like he has three fears one clockwork percussionist would he rather those numbers were flipped absolutely but like they, they, they do work here. Yeah, but the, the double undead sprinter bailed him out hard in pack three. But also he could have he was set up such in pack three that if he saw white bombs, he could have gone red white. Like he really, truly got like if he yeah. opens the white overlord, he's taking white overlord and playing red white in pack three. Like he was still pretty open, I think, to white as an avenue as well. And I think blue and green were cut in pack one. Uh, ultimately he ended up in the right place per the signals in pack one and got paid off for it, which you love to see. Yeah. I mean, uh, you said masterclass and I think that's exactly what this is. I loved, 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 loved watching this draft. And I was really, and like also as a fan of red black, I was selfishly happy that he did get paid <laughs> off for hedging with disturbing mirth. Um, and ultimately he did spoiler three O his draft pod. You love to see it. Uh, not only did he 3-0 this draft pot, he also 3-0'd his day two draft pot. He was the only 6-0 drafter at Worlds. Is that true? I didn't. I saw that he 6-0'd. I didn't know he was the only one who 6-0'd. I think he. I think that's true. I think he was the only 6-0 drafter at Worlds. Yeah. God, what a beast! 
What a beast. Unfortunately, missed out on top eight thanks to Constructed getting him finally, but thrilled like, to see this performance for him in Limited. He's, he's got to let someone else get a dub every now and then, right? <laughs> keep like, it fun. Keep the competition flowing. <laughs> come on. Come on. Just get, We got to take her. I'm teaching Jonah about sharing, taking turns. Simon, let, let someone else take a turn, you know? All right. Who uh, do you want in the top eight? Who's your, who's your pick? It's got to be Kai, right? Yeah, it's I was going to say, such how, a good how, do you, story. How, do you not, how do you not go for Kai? This is, it's so funny because like, you know, the, the meme of like, anytime someone's like, well, it's my last tournament coming up for a while. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. And then they win it. Like, I feel like Kai air quotes retiring from magic earlier this year. And then just being like, oops, top, <laughs> top eight worlds also. <laughs> just um, kidding. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Um, really, really good stuff. I'm excited to, to watch the top eight play out this afternoon. Are you going to watch any constructed? Or are you just going to? Just gonna check the standings. I will. I will just be checking the standings yeah. most likely. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go listen to the Dolphins game on the radio this afternoon. Yeah. So world, is- world is world is done for me. I had all the FOMO happened on all the FOMO happened on Friday and Saturday. That makes sense. Speaking of, did you watch the Vintage Cube Rotisserie Draft? I did. That's right. Oh, uh, we were. I was gonna have us do that, and then I was like, oh wait, I thought it was actually a draft draft. No, it's a rotisserie draft. That would be. It'd be tough for us to try and recap here, but I did watch it. Did you? I also watched it. Yeah, the Jakovitz family cleaned up. In they're gonna be, they're eating well. Draft. Yeah, <laughs> they walked away with six of nine pieces of power, I believe. Is that true? I believe like so. after they finally picked the winnings. I, the, I, felt, yeah, yeah. I fell asleep last night. I woke up this morning and saw that. Uh, was it Luca that won? Yeah, the son won. Yeah. I mean, he had he had ancestral time walk. Spellseeker to go find them. Um, he had Mox. Mox, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then yeah. the dad opened Black Lotus. It's going <laughs> to feel great. Yeah. Um, it was really fun. It, I was thinking about it because as, as I was watching it unfold, I was like, oh, this is so sick. Like, I hope they like do this again or whatever. And then after it was done, I was like, I actually don't know if I do. Like, it feels kind of like like when the beta draft happened a few years back. And I was like, Oh man, are they gonna like keep doing that? And they didn't like makes it feel so much more special. Like I hope they find ways to iterate on it. But it's also weird that it's a it's a very high stakes tournament where the draft felt more the draft is where the stakes are, because that's where you're opening the money. I mean, yes, you're playing for then the pick order to get whatever the scraps of the vintage cube, which are probably still worth, you know, a couple like 10, 20k, I don't know. But like the the real the real money is in the oops did I open Lotus? Well, but also just doing it as a rotisserie draft was genius for viewing for the the excitement of Correct. cracking the packs as well. Also, uh, and I was expecting Luis, it to take Luis a long commenting time. Commenting on a stream and and just knowing what everyone was drafting and able to fill you in the whole way was just chef's kiss. Thanks, Luis. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Luis and BK for doing that. That is definitely uh, how I digested that draft as well. Um, so much, yeah, so much exciting stuff that the addendum to this episode is, <laughs> is the vintage cube rotisserie draft. All right. Anything else before we go? No, I think I should, we should say that we're going to like do things in a, a slightly weird order the next coming weeks. I think we'll plan to do the foundations crash course next week, even though that will then give us a gap week before it goes live. There's no early access event on arena. So we won't have like our usual sort of like half a dozen drafts each to sort of update things. So I think we'll do crash course next week. Then we'll wrap up dusk morn with 50 takes and then dive into foundations the following for two weeks and then have pioneer masters, <laughs> two weeks, pioneer masters, maybe some cube, whatever. No shortage of sets. I bring it on. I say I'm ready. I want it. Mm, I would like a little <laughs> bit less and a little more thought and quality to go into the design of the sets, but who knows? Hey, All Dave, right, great if, place. If there are more Duskmorns on our on our future, I think we're happy to see them. Well, for sure, this format was oh so good. I'm so, I, I yeah, I would keep drafting this format for another month, another two months. It's so good. All right, great place to wrap us up. Thank you as always to Salty Pretzels for our intro and outro music. Make sure you give it a listen. You can find all of our content on our website, lordsoflimited.com. We've got our tier list. We've got our episode backlog. We've got links to our YouTube channel. Um, please head on over there, like and subscribe and, and get all of our, our great content. We finally got it. We did it. The mob won. Ben dropped a video on the YouTube channel. 
this past week. Uh, fans rejoiced. You can check that out there. Um, you can also find our Twitch streams, um, our merch courtesy of T Public, our Patreon page, of course, all of that at lordsoflimited.com. If you've got any feedback about the show or any questions, shoot us an email at lordsoflimited at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next week for another episode of Lords of Limited. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Thank you.